Um, before we talk about the initiative, I'd like to set some context. Uh, the 20th century um, is really held as a momentous century of progression. Do you think we're keeping that momentum going in the first 15 years of this century? Probably less so. I mean, it's obviously, it depends on which area. If you look at, for instance, that golden era from when the Spitfire flew in, I guess, 38 or 39 to when Blackbird flew in 1961, the, the progress there in mechanical and aeronautical engineering was obviously incredible. That has undoubtedly slowed, but of course we've seen huge leaps in other areas, IT and, and um, simulation technologies, etc. So you talk about IT and, and obviously people talk a lot about big data. Do you think these are the areas where really the acceleration is happening this century rather than the last? Yes, I would say so. But what we obviously don't know is, is what the future will hold. I mean, certainly in materials, there's the, the nanotechnology is very exciting. Um, graphene holds tremendous potential that hasn't properly been unlocked yet. You, you beat me too. I was going to ask you what are the areas that we should be looking at. So you think nanotechnology, materials particularly? I think that's an area, I'm not saying it's the area we should be looking at, but it's an area of, of, of tremendous um, progress at the moment. And uh, you do seem to see this through history kind of dictates there'll be pockets, be it mechanical engineering or um, computing or whatever it might be, where there's suddenly a, a big breakthrough that spurns a huge development over a period of one or two decades and then it starts to slow down again. Um, recently I would say yes, nanotechnology is, is certainly on that um, composites has been but that's kind of big progress certainly in the 80s that seems to have slowed at the moment but graphene has big potential there. It's very difficult to forecast. You, you talked a lot about that huge period in aeronautical engineering. Um, in terms of automotive engineering, uh, there's a, a obviously a big change in the drivetrains, um, the sort of power units that, that are starting to be used. Is this going to be an area that's just going to ever increase over the next five, ten years? Are we going to see even more significant changes about the powertrains used in vehicles? I think what's unsung about automotive powertrains is actually the advance in efficiency of the internal combustion engine. Um, actually cars now are regular four-stroke petrol non-hybrid cars are a lot more efficient than they were 40 years ago despite having much bigger, heavier, probably less aerodynamic shapes to pull along than they did in those years. So I think that's that's been a lot of progress but because there's no single sort of if you like sexy breakthrough then then nobody talks about it very much. Um, the drive to electric hybrids or to hydrogen fuel cells whatever that might be all very well if we manage to get nuclear fission to work other than that, then I think you can question its validity. So that's really interesting. Obviously, people would expect you to be focusing on the vehicle, um, but you're not. You're focusing on the infrastructure and looking at the bigger picture and looking at uh, engineering across the entire supply chain and across the infrastructure. Is, is, is that something common in your industry? Well, I think our industry is, I mean, first of all, within motor racing, we aren't really research engineers. We're users of technology. We're too small to go out and do fundamental research. Um, but we will use whatever is provided commercially or commercially available to us very hard and very fast. And I think that's where motor racing teams have become of great interest to large corporations because we can take their products and, if you like, develop them, break them, whatever, um, at a much faster pace than if they were simply offered out into the air aeronautical industry or, or other industries. So as you, you've heard, for this Horizontal Innovation Initiative, we are using case study examples from the motorsport industry. Do you think that's what sets them apart, their ability to take something that exists and just look beyond the normal envelope as to what can be done with it or how it can be applied? I think that's exactly right. In many ways, I mean, it's a bit of an old um, parallel and, and you can argue about whether it's really correct, but in many ways we operate in the, the sort of pace and under the sort of pressure that might happen in wartime. Um, and obviously if I go back to that sort of spitfire to Blackbird, that was effectively wartime, war and then the Cold War. Um, we're under that pressure to perform all the time, and so our timescales are much more compressed. If it's a, a new, for us, a new technology, things like the, the seamless shift gearboxes that came in a few years ago, 
then they might be developed on the dyno over a course of 12 months or so, um, initially then in testing before you finally race them. So that would be kind of the longer end of our time scale. I would have thought if you take that into wider scale, something like the, the double clutch gearboxes that have become popular in sports cars, then that I would have thought would be significantly longer. Um, typically our design times are, are seasonal, so effectively we start designing the monocoque, which is the main structure um, of the car, in somewhere around August, September, September time, um, ready for rollout in January. Uh, the gearbox casing, which is a composite case, similarly. So typically our, our, our maximum lead times will be somewhere around five months. Development of the new car in terms of initial aerodynamic research, layout, etc., might start in May time, again, ready for that January. So initial research, I guess, is somewhere around the from eight months to when the car rolls. Proper hard design work in terms of the final components will start in September. So we're talking about Horizontal Innovations Initiative uh, on the premise that you know, development, innovation, R&D is very vertical. It's kept within an industry uh, sector or sometimes even locked into an individual company. Um, is that the sort of experience that you've seen on the engineering landscape yourself? Well, I'm, I kind of, well, we here operate in our own little bubble, so it's difficult for me to really comment on what goes on outside the motor racing umbrella. But certainly within our, our little sphere, then yes, we try to integrate everything as much as possible. Um, like most motor racing teams, we effectively have four major departments, which are the design office, aerodynamics, uh, vehicle dynamics, stroke simulation, and race engineering, the, the, the engineers that actually operate the car at the track. And so it's all about making sure that those guys all work together as, as closely as possible. Um, we've all seen it over the years where the aero department hasn't talked to the design office, and, and it's patently obvious when you see a car where they haven't communicated. So actually one of the, the stories that kicked off this whole initiative was uh, one from the Motorsport Industry Association about Lockheed uh, in Amptill and they've been trying to develop a solution for about two years and then they went to an MIA event and they met a company that had the solution already off the shelf and they were actually next door to their premises in Amptill. Right, yeah. um, so this is this thing of this notion of if companies could talk to other companies more freely then maybe it could have an impact. Can you see the benefit in that proposal? I can. Um, I mean there's certainly technologies probably that we can benefit from that we're not aware of. We, we like many other teams, have various technical partnerships in certain areas, and we do find that of, of enormous benefit. Um, but that's only within the technical partners that, that we operate with. Um, equally, we can spend time um, with a technical partner. For instance, uh, the company I used to work for had a very strong technical partnership with British Aerospace, which you'd have thought would be a prime company that we could have learned from and in truth we actually found very little synergy. Other companies um, that we work with here, Siemens etc, um, we've got a lot out of so it's, it's not always the obvious that bears fruit and that is probably the biggest difficulty is how you put people together and how you, how you understand what each other can offer. So we have got into the habit of looking out at other companies, seeing what they can provide, then approaching them and using their, their products, their expertise. It's been tremendously powerful within motor racing. It's allowed motor racing to ascend to where it is on the global field of engineering. And I can only imagine that if other companies who perhaps, because they're bigger in the first place, haven't had to do that, were able to operate in a similar manner, they'd find it tremendously beneficial. For me, part of being a good engineer is keeping your eyes open, looking around you. It's, it's very easy to end up kind of blinkered and working on your own little project in, in your own little area each day. When in, in truth, there's inspiration all around us. You go down, I've always taken interest in looking around museums, looking at old cars, um, going, when I'm at the airport, trying to understand how aircraft are evolving because there might not be a direct application but I do find if it kind of makes your mind tick and think about why are they doing that that can become a source of inspiration in 
what I'm, or we are doing ourselves. We're aware that we might need, a, and we have a particular problem which we would like to try and find a solution for, and then go out and try and find a part, technical partner company that can achieve that. An example of that would be where I felt that we needed to try and have a much stronger technical link, um, or communications link, I should say, between the race team during race events and the factory. Because the old model was that the race engineers would go out with the cars, they'd operate the cars through the weekend. Um, if, for instance, there's a technical problem with the car, perhaps the gearbox is playing also up or whatever, they then had to operate as jack of all trades and suddenly become gearbox experts, which clearly they weren't. And I've, I've been there where you've, you've got a pile of broken bits, what do I do next? Um, so with communications, I felt that there was an opportunity to bring that much, much closer. So we set up an operations room here, which is partly for reliability, the gearbox type problem, and partly supportive of the race engineers on the performance aspects, so vehicle dynamics using our drive in the loop simulator that we have based here. So there's a, a driver, a test driver can be in the simulator here between sessions, try evaluating different setups, for instance. But that means a huge pipe between the, the racetrack and the factory. So we went to AT&T and um, after some fretting and that looks extremely difficult, they came out with a solution and, and we were able to operate in that way. I think that's one of the areas that, that I find so hard to get my head around is, is just the sheer quantity of data that is captured on a car during a weekend and now transmitted back to your, you know, your home base or, as well as the pit wall. How much has that use of data escalated in, in your time? Well, when I, in my time, <laughs> almost infinitely, because I started in 1980 when there was nothing. Um, I think data recorders really started to come in in earnest in the very late 80s, with a few sensors here or there, and we had a bunch of squiggly lines which we didn't really understand. Um, I dread to think how many sensors we have on the car now. Do you know? I don't, I honestly don't, but it will certainly be in the, in the, in the hundreds, well, over the, well into the hundreds. Um, the problem then, of course, becomes how do you use that data? It's, it's easy to acquire lots of data. To make it meaningful and useful is, is the real challenge. Do you think, I mean, that, that's absolutely right. Everyone talks about big data, but actually it's the use, usability of that data. Do you think there are other sectors or industries that you could think of that have a lot to learn from what you're achieving in, in motorsport around that, not just the capturing of data, but using it properly? I would think probably yes, because if we're capturing data, generally speaking, there will be a, a weight associated with that, physically the sensors. So each sensor has to very much earn its keep on the car. If it, if it can't do so, it gets chucked off. And, and that forces a, a, an audit certainly once a year and quite often more often than that to make sure that we are using these sensors in a manner which benefits either the performance or the reliability of the car. If it doesn't do one of those two things, then it's, then it's off. So you said when you first started, obviously there was no sensor data at all. Um, how, how big a department is it now that actually captures that data, analyzes the data, um, creates the programs and the experience from that. Is, is it quite a big unit of a team now that's responsible for that part? Yeah, no, it's, it's one of, been one of the big growth areas for sure. Um, having said that, a lot of the responsibility is all, often down to the individual engineers. So in terms of, yes, the physically, um, how do you go about writing the programs to reduce that data? Of course, that's its own department. But then making sure that, that data is used will be the responsibility of the individual individual engineers concerned on, be it a, the operation of the gearbox or the vehicle dynamics or the aerodynamic measuring systems that we have and so forth, those will go into the individual departments and, and, and it will be their responsibility. Adrian, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Thank you.